coming out of Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Called to suffer. Five murderers became five believers. A treacherous tribe of killers became wonderfully evangelized and born again. Almost the whole tribe wonderfully renewed through the gospel. A couple of weeks ago I shared the story of the Alka Indians and how five young missionaries left other possibilities and decided to go to Ecuador and evangelize this lost, unreached people group, a frightening people group. Even contract workers didn't want to work in the area because they would kill anybody that was within range. And finally, when they had made contact and met with the Alkas, they thought the breakthrough had come, but unbeknownst to them, there was a plot underway, and three women appeared on the beach, and the missionaries went to meet them, and behind them were the men, armed with spears, and all five missionaries were slain back in 1956. Ten years before the missionaries got there, one of the women from the Alka tribe fled, because if you were a part of that tribe, your life expectancy was very short. They would literally kill you for any reason. They killed each other, and they killed anybody that they met along the way. It was a tribe filled with violence and hatred and bloodshed. You know, the Bible says that when Cain killed Abel, that the blood of Abel cried out to God. Well, I can only imagine the cry that came from that tribe, because all of them, were di directly affected by murder, and murder was happening on a daily basis. This one fled, and she was met 10 years earlier by a Christian. In fact, one of the missionaries who would go 10 years later was a brother to the sister that met that one woman who left. And she ended up bringing that Alka woman to America, and finally got her involved with the Wycliffe Bible translators. And they started learning the language. They started finding ways to communicate. And those who went 10 years later had very little insight into the language or the customs. But they had a few words, a couple of thoughts, and they made contact. And then all five were slain. Five missionaries killed at once. An incredible loss. In fact, Betty Elliott, the wife of Jim Elliott, had 
forsaken so many of her dreams to give answer to the call that God had given her. And she went with her husband to Ecuador, and there she lost her husband. I can only imagine the pain, the grief, the loss of her future because they had planned to have children. But Betty didn't leave. Betty decided as she prayed and sought God's face that the purpose of God was still alive and well. And so Betty stayed trying to reach out to the tribal folk, including the Alcas. A year later, two women fled, two Alka women, to a nearby village, and Betty heard about it. And you know what she did? She immediately packed a bag and she went to the village, and she made contact with those two women. And she started sharing, in the best way she could, the love of God. And she invited them to come back to the mission. How does somebody do that? Unknown to her, these two were two of the three women that showed up on the beach when the five missionaries were there. They were a part of the ruse, the deception plan. Well, as Betty loved on them and started getting to know the language, they started understanding more and more of the gospel. And when they were there a couple of weeks, that one who had left 10 years earlier came back with the missionary who had taken her back to the States. And now there was much more communication, much more understanding as they started cheering together. And they weren't there just a couple of months when those two women decided they wanted to go back to the Alka tribe. And the one who had come back now almost 12 years uh, separated from the tribe said, I'll go with you. So these three women with three puppies went back into the jungle to go make contact with the tribe. And they wondered if they'd come back alive. Well, just a few weeks later, Betty heard an Alka voice singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. The three women had returned with seven other women from the Alka tribe who had received Christ as a result of the testimony of those three women who had returned to the village. And within a year, Betty was invited to go and join the Alka tribe. And the missionary who had taken that first tribal woman to America, she was invited with her daughter, a three-year-old. Two women with a three-year-old went back to join the Alka tribe. And through the ministry of Christ, that treacherous tribe changed the entire culture the entire belief system. Almost to a person, they were impacted by the gospel. How do five murders result not only in five conversions, but in a whole tribe coming to know Christ? It's the call of God. It's the call, in this case, to suffer. I can only imagine what kind of suffering Betty went through when she discovered that her husband that she loved so dearly was dead when her future in some way had ended, when the whole mission had aborted. In fact, many people thought they should pack and leave. But the call of God was deep enough and strong enough to take Betty into a future that was unknown, but still full of promise. You see, Romans 8 verse 28 says this, All things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Jim was there because of the call of God. Betty was there because of the call of God. Betty stayed because there was a call on her life, not just a tragedy that had happened as a result of their obedience to follow God. And that call used Betty to reach into the hearts of those women who reached into the hearts of those tribal folk. And you know what? The five murderers who had killed the five missionaries all of them came to saving faith. How does that happen? It happens because there's a God who can take what is unfathomable, what is unfair, what is crazy in many ways. Why would they kill people who were trying to be good to them, who were trying to be nice? Well, there were rumors among them that there was something sinister going to happen with these five missionaries, and they decided they've got to go. And so the first chance they had... They murdered them. But God took their bloodshed and turned it into redemption. And the truth is, as we study the scriptures, we will find that pattern repeated again and again. I think Paul is exactly right this morning. 
that the sufferings that come upon your life and mine are not incidental. In God's hands, they are sufferings that make perseverance, that make resolve, that make our lives more focused, that give us greater clarity. I believe as Betty prayed and sought God's face, the call and the vision became clearer still, even in the midst of the great loss of the love of her life. God can take our sorrows and our sufferings and build strength into our lives, perseverance. And out of that comes character, and not just any old character, but the very character of Christ, the kind of courage that Christ had, the kind of determination that Christ had, the kind of love that Christ had. It's not from this world. It's beyond us. There is a very natural tendency in us that if we're hurt, we want to hurt. It's only the grace of God that can take the hurt in our hearts and heal it and replace it with His love. And that's what Paul says. The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Yesterday I was out in the garden. I left to garden. I left to grow things. And I was shocked. I'd watered all my pot plants on Wednesday. Saturday morning, they were all wilted already. This hot 100, 102, 105 degree weather with the wind. It's just murder on pot plants. So I got the garden hose and I was out there watering all of those plants so that they could once again hydrate. And two or three hours later, guess what? The flowers were plump again. All of the leaves were full. And I said, yep, they needed that drink. And then I thought about this scripture. Just like a garden hose or a watering can, the Spirit of God comes and fills us, pours the love of God into our hearts. And God alone knows how we need that. It doesn't take us long to wilt and dry and die unless the love of God replenishes, rehydrates our souls. And Paul says that's what it takes. Suffering is not going to do you any good unless the love of God is poured into your heart and brings healing and brings forgiveness and brings new life and new vision. And Betty Elliot had all of that. You see, sin abounded, suffering abounded, violence abounded, but the grace of God abounded much more. It comes from God Himself. And as we look back over our scriptures, we will see this pattern repeated again and again. Can you imagine Joseph... Young boy, teenage boy, you know how teenagers are. Just trying to be somebody, just trying to figure things out. Sharing his dreams, irritating his family. All the way to his parents who loved him. And finally, can you believe a family would turn against you to the point that they wanted you dead? Think about that. We read that story, but you don't understand how awful that is. To hate your own flesh and blood. And we know the story. Finally, rather than kill him, because they wanted to kill him, they were just thinking of a plan. They finally decided to sell him. I wonder how long it took Joseph to overcome that sense of betrayal and hatred from his own loved ones. We know that even to the end, years later, there was still a wound that he carried inside. A wound that only God could heal. And God did heal. He could finally say with confidence, what you meant for evil. What you allowed the devil to use to attack me and destroy our family, God has turned to good. How does he do that? All things work together for good for those who love God. Even the betrayal of family, even murderous threats, even sold into slavery, even all the betrayals that he went through. The living God changed that in Joseph. He could find a place to forgive and reconcile and be a blessing to the very ones who had resented him and hated him. Let's think of Paul who writes this text. Paul who was so zealous about God's purpose. So much so that he wanted people arrested. And he did arrest them. And he wanted people dead. And he watched them stoned to death. If you've ever watched a stoning, it's a terrible thing. Because often death doesn't come instantaneous. Often somebody's bludgeoned to death by those rocks and there's Paul standing righteous and happy to see another one of those Christ followers dead. And he's wonderfully converted. It's unthinkable. It's like these murderers who come to know Christ. 
How can it be? How can God do a thing like that? You should burn in hell for killing somebody. And God says, no, I love even more than you'll ever understand. And he does. And it's so unthinkable that the Christians who hear about the conversion don't trust him. They don't want to be around him. They don't want to help him. They are suspicious of him. They are resistant. It takes them months to finally accept that maybe it is true. Maybe he isn't an imposter. Maybe he really is a believer. And then as he blazes a trail, he knows suffering. Somebody has said, and wisely so, no good deed goes unpunished. And if you study the life of Paul, his life is a series of good deeds. But right behind them are a series of attacks, a series of sufferings, imprisonments, beatings, stonings, hateful treatment from his own folks, from the people that were a part of his former group. They hated him. They undermined him every chance they could get. They wanted him dead. They plotted his death. Many of them made vows. We will not eat or drink until we kill him. But God protected him. And God used him. And God said, I will take you to Caesar himself and you will speak to him. And God did. Through shipwreck, through attack, through what should have been death sentences. They stoned him once and left him for dead and God raised him up. And he came back. How did he do that? It's a God thing. But you know how it ended? They chopped off his head. And this is what he could say. I've run a good race. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. And God has used these sufferings to bring perseverance. And God has used these sufferings to bring character. And God has used these sufferings to give hope. And hope doesn't disappoint. Let's turn to the most important example of all. Let's look at our own Christ. Fresh out of the wilderness. Kind of like seminary. Got all the education. Got all the preparation. Ready for his first church. Jesus is. Goes back home. At first he has a warm welcome. Homeboy has made good. Man, everybody loves him. And then he sits down for his first service and he starts preaching. And by the end of that sermon, you know what? They resent him. In fact, they are so angry that they march him out and they want to throw him off a precipice. And the Spirit of God protects him and gets him out of that mess. How does that happen? How does it happen that you go full of love and full of the Spirit and the very people you go to attack you? Well, it starts with Jesus. Don't, don't think it's strange. It's not. And from that time on, there was a constant group and it grew to a crowd who would finally say, crucify him, kill him. We want him dead and buried. And they got their way. But here's the truth of the gospel. What they intended for ill, God turned for good. He could go and hang on that cross and finally say, the call has been accomplished. I finished what you asked me to do. And now God has redeemed the whole humanity, not just Israel, but the whole world. Suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character brings hope. And Jesus is the beautiful, living example of how he does that in each of our lives. And Betty Elliot is a modern day example of how God takes the unthinkable injury that was inflicted upon her and her family for no good reason but God took that injury and out of that he birthed love and out of that he brought the gospel and out of the gospel he brought new life and out of new life he changed an entire tribe called to suffering and the truth is believers each one of us is called by God to follow in a similar way whatever it is we're facing a failed marriage, a wayward child, a job that hasn't worked out, a sickness that has come upon us, whatever that suffering may be, in the midst of what is going on, God is saying, I am with you. As I was with Joseph, as I was with Paul, as I was with Christ himself, as I was with Betty Elliot, I am with you. No suffering that comes your way will be wasted because if you love God 
and you're called according to his purpose, he will take whatever it is, just or unjust, and work it for your good. So that you can say with Paul, I've run a good race and I've fought a good fight. And now is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, but not just for me, but for all who love Christ's appearing. Called to suffer. Let us pray. Father, how do you take five murderers and make five saints out of them? Father, how do you take a persecutor like Paul and make of him one of the greatest apostles and evangelists we've ever seen? It is only your grace. It is only your love poured into our hearts. It is only heaven come down to earth. We join Christ this morning and we say, Oh God, fill our lives. Pour in your love. Wherever we are wounded, heal us. As we pray and seek your face, Lord, guide us and direct us that we might run your race, that we might fight your fight, that we might keep your faith, that we might be a part of your wonderful redeeming purpose as you take the likes of Alka Indians and you change them into beautiful saints of God. Long before we've even understood what you're doing, you're at work among us. Thank you for that, Lord. I, as one, thank you for your grace and your forgiveness that turned me a wayward son and made me a part of your family. And I pray for each one of us this morning, draw us close, close to you and close to each other. It's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.